Hello, investing friends. Welcome into Investors Club. Got a great show for you. There's a new Alzheimer's drug that is submitting for approval in Europe. Very interesting. We'll take a look at it. That wasn't really on our radar. We'll take a look at it. a tau drug. Very interesting stuff. We'll take a look at that. Uh, a lot of details on that. We'll also take a look at Medusa Medusa commented to us on YouTube about dividend stocks pillorying, pillorying our dividend stock strategy. Well, we'll take a look at that. We'll take a look at that and we'll actually say that we agree with a couple of his points. And then we'll go on to say that dividend investing is a powerful out strategy for outperformance. It's got to be in your portfolio. Got to be in your portfolio. And uh, we'll push back against some notions that it's that there's that there's uh, that it's it's that it's less than wonderful, and that you have to pay taxes and things like that. You don't. You don't. You don't. There's wonderful things to take advantage of, and you should. All right, let's get right into it. Not investment advisor, not investment advice, number one ranked stock analyst in the world. This is the best research and analysis in the world because this is for us, you and me, the regular investors. Financial media is for hedge funds and special interests trying to screw you and me. So we're doing uh, the best research in the world, getting the best interviews. Let's get right into this. Uh, let's get right into it. This This do, 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 do. Okay, so this is Tau Luce, this is Tau RX. So this is a company called Tau RX. And in May, they released some preliminary data. And then they went to an Alzheimer's conference in June and released some more. Interesting stuff. It looks like they got something good enough to submit. But to me, it doesn't look as good as Semifilam, Cassava Sciences Semifilam. And it looks like it's possibly working on as an acetylcholine esterase type inhibitor. So like Denepazil, the, the drugs that were approved in 2003, like Denepazil, uh, to treat symptoms, they work, but they don't treat the underlying cause and, and people keep getting worse. Well, this, uh, when, when people are on those drugs, this drug doesn't work as well. And that's possibly similar to Anavex. So let's take a look. So this is Tau RX. They did a lucidity trial. Their drug is hydromethylthionine mesylate. And it did not, uh, over 65 weeks, patients did not get better, but they did get uh, worse much, much more slowly. They almost stabilized. So pretty good. Really, no, no, no. Really good. Really good. Really good. Uh, announced unblinding of initial data from completion of the randomized portion of their pivotal phase three trial lucidity. Now, this is the initial data release, and they weren't too forthcoming on details. Then they went to this conference, and again, they weren't too uh, forthcoming on details. Nevertheless, they're going to submit. So it looks like it's good, not great to me. Looks like it's good, not great. So it's an oral drug, so that's good. 598 people. The output indicates that participants receiving HMTM decline at a rate substantially less than is typical in Alzheimer's based on published research. So this was, they didn't have a placebo portion in that portion. This was seen for both cognitive and functional endpoints across a broad range of severity from mild cognitive impairment to moderate Alzheimer's. Importantly, the safety profile is favorable and consistent with previous studies. Favorable and consistent with previous studies. They would have said more in my opinion, if it was as good as cassava sciences, where the placebo group had fewer adverse events, or if the placebo group had more adverse events than the drug group, and there's never been a safety signal in any of the studies. So this, this here, and then if, when they did further re release later in June, they didn't get into the details of the safety. So I guess the safety is pretty good. My guess it's probably something like Denepazil, but it's, that it, it's probably not spotless like Semifilam seems to be. Okay. Because they're general about it. Favorable and consistent. Well, I went back to look at the previous studies. They still weren't too forthcoming about the safety. They just said it was pretty good. They, weren't, they didn't give a lot of details. And then they went to this, uh, the 35th Global Conference of Alzheimer's Disease International. But then they gave a summary about it. They didn't, they didn't release the details about that. Nevertheless, their expert advisory panel says that they should go to regulatory submission. This is a Singapore slash Scottish company. There's the Scottish 
government does some sort of uh, some sort of research and then has this company Tau RX, which is a Singapore Tau, a Singapore Singaporean Scottish company, then does something with that uh, IP. The analysis showed that whilst hydromethylthionine has a similar concentration response profile in patients taking the drug as an add-on therapy to the routinely used symptomatic treatments. So this is where the drug doesn't work that well when you're already taking denepazil. So it seems like, just like with Anavex, it may be working on the same pathway. So the maximum effect in these patients was reduced by half when they were already taking denepazil, so it doesn't work as well. This finding supports the hypothesis that symptomatic drugs for this condition interfere with the disease-modifying treatment of hydrothionine. That is a stretch to me. They're saying that, the, the, that this drug, you should just take it as, as a fact that it's modifying the disease and not the symptoms. Mm, I don't think so. It looks to me like it might be modifying the symptoms. And then furthermore, where is the behavior? If this is truly modifying disease itself, why is there not behavioral stuff? They said cognitive and functional, but they did not say behavioral. So, and then, so to me, this is a stretch. This finding supports the hypothesis that symptomatic drugs for this condition interfere with the disease modifying treatment. No, no. What it says is that this drug seems to be treating the symptoms just like the other symptom treating the drugs. So I'm very dubious on that. I'm not, I'm not dubious on the drug. I'm glad it's there. And I think it looks like a pretty good one. But it looks like it has overlap with uh, the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. But this is interesting. So they went to this conference and they did a fireside chat. And they brought a person that has Alzheimer's disease, Stanley. And we'll, we'll see if we can get Stanley on the show. I'll invite the, uh, the people from this company and I'll invite Stanley as well. Joining them were special guests Stanley, who lives with Alzheimer's, and his son Martin. Stanley took part in an early clinical trial, now continues to take the investigative medication as part of an extended access program. Initially overwhelmed by his father's diagnosis, Martin explained he actively searched Google for information on what they could do to discover clinical trials. Listening to the shared experience of Stanley taking part in the clinical trial with the support of an experienced clinician in the field was overwhelmingly positive. And so, again, they didn't, uh, the whole, everything about that conference, they just said positive, was received well. They didn't give details. They said they gave the initial release of data in May. Then they said, we're going to give more details in June. And they didn't really seem to give many details. So to me, I think it looks like a good one. But I, I, frankly, I'm not convinced at all that it's disease modifying. It looks to me like it's symptom modifying. And so the safety, I think the safety is probably pretty good, but why weren't they more detailed on it? It probably has a denepazil safety pro profile, I guess. Efficacy, is, so the efficacy, it looked like it was pretty good. It was, it was slowing, uh, slowing uh, disease, slowing decline. It was slowing decline but it wasn't making uh, improvements. And if it was truly disease modifying, maybe we would see uh, improvements. And then is there denepazil overlap? Well, it seems to be. If you already take denepazil, the half the effect of the drug goes away. AVXL overlap, we saw the same similar things with AVXL. It's possibly also working on a, the, the sigma receptor is possibly also working on the acetylcholinesterase pathways. And then where is behavior? If this is truly disease modifying, they gave cognition and they gave function, but where is behavior? If this is truly disease modifying, why, are we, why won't they talk about uh, the NPI scale? So this looks encouraging, but I don't think it's miraculous and I don't necessarily think it's disease modifying, but I guess they'll take it for submission in Europe. Uh, they got some sort of uh, accelerated approval, some European accelerator program. So interesting stuff there. What do you think about that? And then here is Medusa Medusa. It looks like the kind of guy you don't want to mess with, so I'll, I'll tread lightly here. But Medusa says, I like your Sava content, but I don't like your dividend stuff. And uh, then he came back with another dividend comment, uh, just really pillorying dividend, dividend investing in the first place. And he makes a couple of points, but he misses a couple of crucial things. And so let's talk about it and why dividend investing should definitely have a place in your investing portfolio. Dividend stocks are subject to taxes. The company that pays you a dividend has to pay taxes on their income before paying you a dividend. Can't avoid that latter part. Later on, you can avoid paying taxes when you use an IRA account, but how much can you put in that account? 6,000? If that's enough, fine. Well, that's wrong. That is just wrong. Can't avoid that latter part where the company pays taxes, then you get your money. That's completely wrong. 
If you uh, subscribe to the Big Dividends newsletter, we have Bermuda stocks in there. Bermuda, there is no corporate tax at all, and there's no withholding. It's a pass-through. It's a pass-through. You should know about these special situations that are there to take advantage of. No taxes. And if you're in a Roth IRA, you have a business that makes money and profits that you get never, ever, 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 ever paying the tax man. Ever. Not just, not just Bermuda's uh, pass-throughs. How about master limited partnerships? Those are pass-throughs. No taxes. How about business development companies? Those are pass-throughs. No taxes. How about real estate investment trusts? Those are pass-throughs. No taxes. How about closed end funds? Those are pass-throughs. No taxes. You have to know about this stuff. It's a huge, wonderful opportunity. Can't avoid that part where you pay income tax? No. If you do it right, there's none. Zero. None. 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 Bermuda companies, closed end funds, master limited partnerships, business development companies, real estate investment trusts, all of which are in the big, di big dividends portfolios. Subscribe. The second thing is that the price of a share is automatically lowered by the value of the dividend they paid. So yes, you're getting some cash to your account, but the value of your shares is lowered by the same value in, money, in dollars. All things being equal, that is true. If a company uh, pays out 90 cents per share, then you, would, you should see, now the market moves each day, so you don't actually see it go exactly 90 cents, uh, but, it, the market, but all things being equal, that does happen, that's true. But so what? That doesn't mean, it's not, it's, that's a wash. That's neither good nor bad. That's not an argument for or against. Next, if you need some cash monthly, that's the way to go. But if you don't need that cash monthly, it's a great idea if you need a monthly income or if you're a fund that needs some cash each month to pay all the costs. But if you need cash each month, you can get the same cash selling covered calls. Well, hold on there, my friend. Dividend stocks outperform. Dividend stocks outperform. Holding dividend stocks makes you outperform. Do covered calls outperform? They do not. They'll sometimes have uh, periods where they, where they outperform, but they don't outperform. Here is covered calls versus holding the S&P 500. There were periods where, the S where covered calls did better than the S&P, but just sitting in the S&P over this 20-year period was better. And in this shorter period here, sitting in the S&P was much better. There will be times when covered calls do better than, uh, than just sitting in an index, but it generally doesn't. So we do have a covered call ETF in the big dividends fund, three of them, if you are interested in that strategy. And there will be times when the market when that, that strategy does outperform in the market. And if you want to diversify, perhaps you include those as part of a broader portfolio. But that strategy is not a strategy for outperformance. Holding dividend stocks is a strategy for outperformance. So he sells self-covered calls, which I'm not against, and that, that can be a way to diversify because it's a different strategy that will have its own risk profile in different markets, but that's not a strategy for outperformance. Another issue is that the company pays dividends because doesn't know what to do with its cash, doesn't have ways to invest it, so their growth is limited. They any times reach their full expansion. And this is true. And this is a great point. And this is the reason why you look at small innovation stocks. If you're looking for the next big, big thing, it's probably not going to be a dividend stock. It's true. It's absolutely true. So if you're looking for the next 100Xer, it's almost certainly not a dividend stock. Okay, but guess what? Those small innovation stocks that you and I love so much that we should be picking through to find the very best gems, as a group, that group underperforms. You don't want to just uh, broadly uh, diversify across small innovation. Uh, you want to pick the very best ones. So uh, the company doesn't know what to invest in with its cash. That's true. If a company's paying dividends, it's because they, they say, we don't have this amazing Alzheimer's drug to sink our money into. Let's pay it out to the, to the shareholders. That's true. But it's a, you're, these are long shots. When your Alzheimer's drug and whatnot are long shots. And the best companies, the best stocks will be these small innovation stocks. But as a group, they underperform, not outperform. So dividend stocks outperform. And it's, it's a great point. It's a point that Peter Thiel makes. You pay out dividends when you don't have a good investment to make. When you can't get a good return on your capital, you pay out dividends. Great point. 
And that's why you look for the small stocks like cassava or the other uh, where food come from, the small innovation uh, growth stocks. It's true. They have places to put their money to get a better return. But that stuff doesn't always work out and there's risk involved. And overall, the broad portfolio, if you dive, if you allocate to a diversified dividend portfolio, you should outperform. If you allocate to a diversified growth and innovation portfolio, you should underperform. Doesn't mean you shouldn't look for the, the best gems. You should. You should look for the best gems in the small caps, small growth and innovation, and then broadly diversify in dividends. And lastly, some companies were taking loans to keep paying their dividends and not be sold by some funds. Do you really want to get a dividend that is given you that way? Well, look at the big dividends portfolio. I have 141 of the best dividend paying stocks and securities in the world. None of them are, are borrowing to pay their dividend. So sure, there are lousy dividend companies, but don't buy them. Buy the 141 best ones in the world. They're in the big dividends newsletter. Medusa, I appreciate your uh, feedback. If you email me, I'll give you a free subscription to the Big Dividends newsletter. And with that, my investing friends, you can see the list of pass-throughs there. With that, my investing friends, let's go to the phones. Rasmus, my friend, great to see you. Let's hope Saba is far ahead of the pack. And we also get some news from them at some point when they have something solid. And of course, good morning, Joe. Good morning, Rasmus. Yes. And I'll tell you what, Tau RX took Stanley, Stanley and, and brought him to that fireside chat. Well, why can't Cassava do something like that? Why can't Cassava do something? It seems like they can. I didn't know if they, we didn't, I think we didn't know if they could or they couldn't do something like that. But if Tau RX is doing it, I don't see why, I don't see why Cassava can't. Tim, hi, Joe, not too worried about them being our competitor. Do you think we are headed for a market crash? Well, we already had a market crash. I got to tell you, it's not too good. The, uh, the, I mean, a recession is so imminent, obviously. Inflation, the consumer's in big trouble with inflation. It's not good. Uh, I, would, I mean, what I really see, my friend, is sort of a... The middle class is just going away. I just see sort of a restructuring of the economy rather than a, a cyclical thing. So the, 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 there's going to be, I think, more poor people and more rich people and less middle people. And uh, that's going to be reflected in the market in different ways and ultimately have a recession. But we've already paid so much pain. I don't know if we're going to crash right here. I'm not betting on that, but... Got to be diversified, got to have some growth, got to have some dividends, got to have some cash, real estate, and maybe some gold, some Bitcoin. Tim, do you think IKT is the next Saba? If so, what is the time frame? We should, it should be about a year until we see Parkinson's info. So maybe in about a year we could get the, the remember in April, or so of 2021, whenever it was, uh, Cassava announced their six month open label data and the stock really, really exploded. That could be, that, that could be uh, the one year, and I think it's even placebo controlled in the phase 2B, uh, that'll be well one year data, or we'll have data on that in about a year. So that, that could be possibly the, the big time. All right, my investing friends, great to see you. We'll do it again tomorrow. I've got a bunch of, join the Big Dividends newsletter. I've got a bunch of big, cool stuff coming. Uh, I'm going to start out with, with so one of those pass-throughs, those Bermuda-based pass-throughs. It's a really good one. Got an insurance company. Insurance, the math is just in your favor. And then it's a Bermuda stock, so there's no corporate tax. Hold it in your Roth. There's no tax at all. There's just math in your favor that gives you money. Pretty good. Join that big dividends newsletter. About to do a whole series of all the, I have eight insurance companies in there. About to do that series, and you'll get those a week ahead of time. And Tim says, Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Tim. Great to see you here. Tim and Rasmus, uh, thank you guys so much for being here. Uh, really great to see you. And uh, we'll do it again tomorrow, and I will see you in the Discord. Join the Discord. Join the, the, the small cap and the big dividends newsletter. And I'll see you guys uh, in the Discord and we'll do more videos 
Uh, we'll do it again 11 tomorrow. And great to see you. See you tomorrow. And in the Discord. See you in the Discord.